Hello and welcome to my talk about what happens to cryptography in a classical quantum world, if we ever get to an actual proper quantum computer. I'm Danny Uzel and I am going to go through how we started keeping secrets in the first place. And that's going to be in terms of things like ancient civilization, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And this is going to be particularly in terms of military and warfare. Then I'm going to move on to the digital world. So how has secret keeping changed since the birth of the World Wide Web and, well, the computers that came before it? And then finally, I'll go on to the post-quantum world. So what is actually going to happen when we actually get a proper quantum computer? D-Wave doesn't count. So a bit about me. So I'm Danny, and I love coffee, and I also love music. And so I got really into timing because music is waves, like frequency is pitch and amplitude is how loud or quiet it is. And so I ended up doing physics. And while I was doing physics, I was also in a band and used to get really mad at the bassist who always went out of time. And at the time as well, I need to stop saying time, there was this whole thing in the physics world about trying to redefine the second. And it turns out the physical thing that makes a more accurate clock, so you can get more accurate seconds, is also the same physical thing that makes a really good quantum bit. So, of course, I decided I was going to go down that route and ended up um, basically stabilizing laser frequencies for ion traps. Anyway, after doing that for a bit, I switched to normal computers. And after seeing somebody pay for coffee with their face in China, I switched to security. And so that's why I'm here today. Anyway, let's get started. So how did they keep secrets way back in the day? So it was always in terms of the military. And there were rumors that um, like a general would shave one of his soldiers' heads and tattoo it on his a message on his head, let it grow, and then send it. That is a really, really inefficient way to send secrets. Um, and then there was also stories about how you used to get a message and you had to wrap it around a bat. And the bat had to be the right length in order to be able to read the message. And if it wasn't, then it made no sense whatsoever. So I did not mean to do that. But anyway, um, so the most popular one you probably know about is the Caesar cipher. And that basically was when you would shift a series of letters in the alphabet by a fixed amount. And you can think of that like a modulus operation. So you only have 26 letters in the alphabet, and let's say you wanted to shift every letter by five. If you're shifting W, you get to the end, you have to come round to the beginning again. And that was OK, but it would be really easy to kind of break that cipher. And so you had other things after that, um, and you had the military, and you had um, other people, always in war, trying to figure out better and better ways to keep secrets. But I guess it wasn't until the 20th century when you actually had computers that could do a lot more than people when it came to encrypting and decrypting things. And then you also had the World Wide Web, where we were sending emails trying to do financial transactions over the web. And that's when secret keeping became more of a science. So you'd have your message, and we would call that the plain text. And you'd have a key which you'd use to encrypt it. And you would do that, and you'd end up with something called ciphertext. That would be that scrambled up information that Eve, a uh, evil observer here, cannot understand. Bob would have a corresponding key. He'd be able to decrypt that ciphertext, and he'd get the original information. Alice is the one over there, by the way. So now we had keys, and the bigger the key, the more secure the encryption. And you can also 
do something similar yourself. So say, for example, you wanted to encrypt hello. I got a key off a website and hello looked like that. So Bob and Alice would be able to see the hello, but Eve would only see that scrambled bit of information and it wouldn't make any sense to her whatsoever. But how do we actually securely send our information over the World Wide Web now? Well, we do it via TLS or transport layer security. And the aim of that is to ensure confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. And that uses a combination of symmetric and asymmetric keys to do that. And I'll go through why in a second. But if you're interested, just click on the lock by your URL bar on a browser, and you can get an idea of the kind of information that's being sent. Um, and there you'll see things like the versions and types of um, protocols being used. So let's go through one. So TLS. Again, we have Alice, we have Bob, and we have Eve at Evil Observer. Let's say Alice and Bob have already agreed who they are. So Alice has said, I've authenticated Bob. He is who I think he is. So let's start talking. Bob is going to have a public and private key. And the generation of those keys is going to be really, really important as we go through. He is going to send over his public key as part of a certificate. Alice can then take that information and she's going to generate a master key. That master key, she's going to encrypt with the public key, Bob's public key, and then she's going to send it back over to Bob. Bob can decrypt that encrypted master key because he has the private key. And so once that's done, that back and forth sending of information, Alice and Bob can now generate session keys. And among other things, those session keys are going to be based on the master key Eve sent and Bob decrypted. So their session keys should be the same. So after that, sorry, let's do that. After that, they can now communicate. And that is basically our handshake. The first part, in terms of the public and private key, was what we call the asymmetric part. And the last part would be the symmetric part. So then you're probably wondering, why use two different versions? So the symmetric part, when the two keys are the same, that is secure, but if those keys get sent or Eve actually gets hold of them, that's going to be a really, really big problem because the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt information. So you're probably thinking, why not just use the asymmetric keys? Because Eve will never have the private key, so she can never decrypt anything even if she does have the public key. Well, this goes back to the key generation part. So let's talk about symmetric keys. That symmetric key is just basically a really, really long, long number of zeros and ones. And you're going to have some plain text. Think of this as like Azure encryption. So if the plain text and the key are the same, you're going to get a zero. If the plain text and the key are different, you end up with a one. And there we have our ciphertext. And what you can do is you can encrypt information in terms of blocks and block ciphers. And that's what most browsers do. So it's going to take a chunk of data. It's going to encrypt it. It's going to pass that along and keep doing that over and over again. And the most common examples or the most widely used ones are AES and DES. So AES is the Advanced Encryption Standard. And that was set by something called NIST which I will also come to again later. So if Eve wants to try and 
decrypt any information without having those symmetric keys, it's basically a really, really long computation of her trying to figure out what a number is at a certain point. And so we go, we keep going, we keep going. It's going to take a very long time, especially when your keys are very, very large. But then what about the asymmetric one? So asymmetric one is a bit more tricky than that, but the easiest way to do, or the easiest way to think about it, is think about it in terms of complementary colors, right? So let's say you've got a color, uh, or Alice has a color, and she wants to send that color to Bob without Bob, uh, without Eve knowing what it is. If she uses the, com if she combines her color with some sort of complementary color and sends it over to Bob, and then Bob knows or can figure it out, then they can send information back and forth without Eve knowing about it. So you've got a system for encrypting and you've got a system for decrypting. That's probably a really bad explanation, but I'll do it better now. So first part is there are a few um, basic parts when it comes to the asymmetric key generation. And there's also a load of maths involved. So do you remember Caesar and his cipher and how it was almost like a modulus? So once you get to the end of the alphabet, you've got to go back to the start again. So modulus is basically like this. So you've got 12 mod 25. That's going to give you 1, because 12 times 2 is 24. And then you've got a 1 remainder. And that's what the modulus is doing. And that's a really, really important thing to keep in mind for what's going to come next. So next, prime numbers. When we're trying to do these asymmetric keys, we need a public key and a private key to be mathematically linked, but different. So let's say we've got N, we've got P, and we've got Q. P and Q are prime numbers, and N is also going to end up being a prime number. And for now, we're going to say that N is going to be our public key. So prime factorization, that is one of the biggest or foundations of this. So let's say you want to factor or do prime factorization. That has not gone how it was supposed to go. OK, has anyone? OK, so let's. Um, Let's do some prime factorization. So let's say we started with 36. And what we're doing over and over again is trying to get down to a factor of 1. And when we've got a small number, that's pretty straightforward. Try or imagine doing that when you've got a number like 960. That's going to involve quite a few more steps. Next, let's go back to our prime numbers. So we've got to now choose P and Q. We're always going to start with small ones. So we've got P is 2, Q is 7, so our N is going to be 14. What we want to do next is we want to find numbers that have no common factors with 14. So we want to find the greatest common denominators of P and Q. Do that and you end up with 1, 3, 5, 9, 11, and 13. So you basically end up with six numbers. And that's a really, really, really important thing. It's so great that a mathematical genius called Luke Euclid came up with a formula for it. So he said, if you want to find the greatest common denominator of P and Q, you do P minus 1, Q minus 1, and you're going to end up with six, which is basically what we got before. So then, how do we actually use that to encrypt and decrypt something? So we can say we have an encryption key, and we've got a decryption key. 
And if we do the modulus of the result of you kids' formula, we want that to be equal to one. So, any questions so far? I've probably done a lot of maths, but just to check that you're paying attention, let's say that we had to say that um, D has to be five. What would E be? Yeah, I'm only joking. You're not going to work that out. So the answer is 11. But that is the kind of steps you have to take to be able to generate these asymmetric keys. It's a lot of work. And it's a lot harder than with the symmetric keys. So that can give you an idea of why we only use the asymmetric keys in the initial part of the handshake, because they're quite expensive. And then once we've used them to set up a secure channel, then we can use the symmetric keys to pass the data back and forth securely. So recap, when you're using an algorithm to generate your symmetric keys, you don't really use one. You just basically come up with a really, really long string. When you use an algorithm like RSA to do your asymmetric keys, you've got three steps there. You've got to pick your prime numbers. You have to find the, the sum or the number of the greatest common denominators from your two <laughs> prime numbers. And then you have to try and figure out what D and E are so that the modulus of m and multiplication is equal to 1. Then we'll end up with a public key and private key that are mathematically linked, but separate. So a public key is going to be the product of P and Q and a combination with E. And a private key is going to be the product of P and Q in combination with D. So, Eve isn't happy, but she, because she has no idea what's going on for now, but that's about to change. So, you all probably heard about the Schrodinger cat thing. So, the cat is both dead or alive until you actually open the box. Um, and that is basically one of the greatest foundations of a quantum computer, or quantum mechanics. Well, there are two, actually. One is superposition, uh, the idea that something is in a combination of several different states, and you can't know what it is until you collapse it. And the second one is something called entanglement. And that's the idea that, say, for example, you had two twins, and you took them to completely opposite ends of the world, then if you kind of observe something about one twin, it would tell you something about the other. In order to be an actual quantum computer, it has to display certain properties. So it needs to be scalable and have well-defined qubits. So at the moment, you've got one with AWS, and that's based on ions. It has to have long decoherence times. So coherence is the idea that everything is more or less in sync. So decoherence is the opposite. And then it needs to be able to use a universal set of quantum gates or quantum operations. So quantum computers are going to be a really big thing because they're really, really good at solving specific tasks with many possibilities. And that's things like molecular modeling, database searching, weather forecasting. They're not so good with doing the other stuff. But these quantum computers have to have enough qubits in order to actually run as a quantum computer. What do I mean? Well, if we take classical computers, you're either going to get a zero or one. This thing in the middle here is something called the block sphere. And that demonstrates how a qubit can work. So 
you can either have zero or one, or you can have a combination of everything in between at the same time. So let's say you have three bits in the classical world. That's just going to give you a seven. But if you have three qubits, you can get a combination of all of those numbers there. So you're basically getting, as opposed to one solution or result or measurement, you're getting two to the n, two to the number of qubits in to get your result. So why is this going to become dangerous or basically not so good? There's two sides to it. So this is going to be really, really good for encryption. It's also going to be very, very bad for encryption. And that was demonstrated by these two, Shaw and Grover. So they came up with algorithms that could basically be used to either break or weaken our existing um, encryption methods on the web. So the first one um, with Grover, he basically made a quantum algorithm that made searching unstructured data really, really easy or easier. And then Shaw came up with an algorithm that basically was able to show or basically reduce the time that you factorize large, large prime numbers. There is our problem. So let's look at it in a bit more detail. So remember we have those, those symmetric keys, they're just a long list of numbers. So with Grover's algorithm, he's basically saying what we could do is, on a quantum scale, i.e. I'm going to have several qubits going in at once, that can account for everything in that or every possible solution of that key. What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some sort of rotation or gate in that block sphere. And what that's going to do is it's going to say, try and find that right solution. If that solution comes out as being right, I'm going to negate it. And then I'm going to look through this list, and any um, solution that has been negated, I'm then going to amplify and make it positive again. And so you'll come out with a graph that looks like this. You've got some solutions at the bottom that haven't been amplified, and you've got one that has been that looks like it could possibly be the right answer. But this method is just going to give you loads and it's going to give you loads and loads of possible answers as well. So it's not going to break it, but it is going to seriously weaken it. Because rather than having to do n over 2 iterations, it's going to reduce it to a square root. And what that means is it weakens it, but you can also just increase the length of the symmetric key. So it's not really that big of an issue. The bigger issue comes with Shaw's algorithm. So Remember all of that modular mathematics I went through before? You're probably starting to notice something. There's a repetition here, or there's a period. And in our case, it's six. So that six is also our M, remember? That's going to be that M. from here, p minus 1, q minus 1. So what you can do is, if you can try and find that m, you can try and find a factor, or sorry, if you can try and find that period, you can try and find the, fa the factors on m, and you can do this over and over again. But why is that easier in a quantum world as opposed to a classical world? Again, it comes down to the idea that you've got superposition. So you can take loads and loads of possible solutions and put them in to get your result out. And this one, this one is actually going to get you a result. And it does it using something called a quantum Fourier transform. So that's the period 
inverse of period is time. And in a normal Fourier transform, that is all about mapping a wave from frequency space to time space and back again. Quantum Fourier transform is going to do exactly the same thing, but it's going to do a lot faster. And so you're going to possibly end up with something like this. And you can see there, it's a periodic function. You can get those values, and you can figure out what m is. It's going to take a few more iterations, but the main thing is, a classical one has an exponential time. This has a logarithmic time. So it does it a lot faster. Eve is starting to get a bit happy now because she can find a way to either weaken one system or break another one. But there's a catch. Shaw and Grover's algorithms need thousands, if not tens of thousands of qubits. Latest check, IBM's, had about 127, so we are a very long way off. But it's only a matter of time. So why worry about that now? Actually, I'm going to ask you guys, why would that be a problem now? We're a really long way off a proper quantum computer but why would we want to start thinking about it now? I guess storage, storage is cheap, right? So we can just save a lot of data and maybe like 50 years time try to decode it. Is that one? Perfect. Yeah, Eve is evil. So she's basically going to store your information. And then once a proper computer or a proper quantum computer comes out, she can decode it and have a very happy time. So NIST the National Institute of Standards and Technology, based in the US, they came up with a competition in 2016. And that competition, they basically opened it out and they said, can, you, can anyone, anyone can submit a post-quantum algorithm? Because we could go down the route of quantum encryption and something called the quantum key distribution, or distribution, but remember, we are still a very long way off a proper quantum computer. So instead, what's going to happen is people, or what has happened is people have come up with algorithms that use classical communication channels, but will be quantum resistant. There's a few things that are important. First, they have to be quantum resistant, but they do also need to be resistant to classical attacks and they need to be secure, and they also need to be fast. So they've had a few rounds, and in 2019, 69 got through. Then in the next round, 26 got through. A couple did actually fail the classical security test. Um, but now we're left with these at the last check. So you have things that are code-based, lattice-based, and isogeny-based. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I am going to go through the lattice-based one because that is the most popular at the moment. So let's think about lattices, right? Um, lattices, or basically you've got vectors that can represent a distance and a direction, and a basis is going to be a collection of two of those. And the lattice is going to be based on these bases. If you've got um, a vector that is almost orthogonal, that's a good one. And if you've got um, a, a vet set of vectors that are almost parallel, that's bad. And the reason for that is you can have more than one basis describe a single point in the lattice. So what Alice can do is she can say her private key is going to be a good basis, and her public key is going to be a bad one. And then Bob can come along and use Alice's public key to um, in, uh, encrypt any information. And then Alice can use her private key to decrypt it. And then again, because Eve is blind to this, she cannot get hold of any information. 
And the reason why this one is popular is because at the moment, even with quantum algorithms that are in the future, there doesn't seem to be any at the moment that would be able to break this problem. The next one that is linked to this is something called learning with errors. So what you could do is you can say, you've got a set of equations, and what you're going to do is Alice is going to have a private key, which is x, y, and z, and then her public key is going to be the set of equations. And what you can do is you can add some noise or basically add errors to those numbers. And if you add errors to those numbers like that, it's going to be harder to figure out what's going on. I ran through that quite quickly because there's a lot of maths going on and we want to get to the good stuff. So, post-quantum cryptography, they're going to have, it's going to have larger key sizes and it's going to be bigger in terms of computational time. Is that really going to be useful in our TLS handshakes? Are we going to be able to do everything we used to be able to do in a post-quantum crypto world? Well, that's the problem. So Cloudflare and Google, they conducted a wide-scale um, experiment to see what would happen using different post-quantum key exchanges. So one was based on lattices, and the other one was based on isogeny. And it seemed to be a toss-up between key size and speed. The isogeny one had about key sizes of about 330 bytes, but it had a high computational cost. And then the lattice-based one had key size of about 1,000 bytes, uh, but that was a few orders of magnitude faster. But remember, compare that to what we've got at the moment, where we've got key sizes of a few bytes, that's pretty big. So what they did is they then measured the length of a handshake. That's the initial hello to the final goodbye message. The fast algorithms with the large key sizes were more suitable than the slow algorithms with the small key sizes. And that's going to be good for IoT, Internet of Things, but not so great for smaller devices. And it can also possibly introduce a new attack vector. Because if you've got these really, really large key sizes being stored, you could trigger a possible denial of service attack. So, what to do about the post-quantum world? Well, the crypto apocalypse may or may not come. It is always better to be prepared. This whole post-quantum cryptography journey could be an entire waste of time, because we may never get a massive quantum computer. But let's say or see what NIST says in the end. Any questions? Ah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, I think you've got to get a microphone. <laughs> one, one? Okay. Uh, do you know any uh, algorithm that can help with encryption using quantum capabilities and not only like using old stuff trying not to be broken by uh, quantum computers so we can use quantum properties to encode something so that is not bro broken by kind of other quantum computer, I guess? Yeah, so that, that's what we call the quantum key distribution. Uh, so that is, um, there's research going on into that now about using um, quantum algorithms to protect information. But again, that's going to need thousands of qubits, and we don't have that yet. But you can read up about it on NIST's website. Any other questions?
Does anyone care? <laughs> Does anyone think that we'll actually get a quantum computer by 2030, like a proper one? Okay. Care to elaborate? I'll pay you five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> no, I spent my life in a basement with lasers, and that was what, like... I'm not going to say because that shows my age, but it's going to take a while. What are the forces? What do you mean? Why do we take a while? Mm, it's, the, it's the whole coherence part about it. So, in order, so if I go back to it, so the um, in order to have a quantum computer, you've got the superposition side, but you need all of these qubits acting like a single system. And so, in order to get them acting like a single system, you have to do what we call entangling the qubits. But the issue with that is, one, how they're stored, and B, um, environmental factors. So, let's take the example of an iron trap. And I'm going to say this like very briefly. Right, so if you've got an iron trap and we've got an iron in it, the way you keep it um, all in place is basically using um, electromagnetic fields. But you are, these things are going to fluctuate and they can make it, and so because of the fluctuating nature, it makes it harder to keep everything together. Actually, let me do another example. Imagine I had like, I don't know, 20. Um, marbles equally spaced on the table. Um, and if I was to say knock the table, the marbles are going to are going to separate. And so let's say they are no longer entangled. Imagine doing that with a thousand marbles on the table. Trying to keep them in place when you knock a table or anything like that is going to be really, really hard. And some knocks you cannot account for, and everything's just going to go everywhere, and so it's going to be unentangled. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's a very good Cool. So, yeah, so at the moment, the best, the forerunners in this are basically, yes, yeah, the iron trap ones. Um, and if you want more information about it or to look at all the different algorithms, um, QuizKit by IBM has some really, really good simulations for all the different algorithms that you can look at and try out. And I would actually recommend it because it will give you a better idea of A, how life might be for you when you actually, if you ever actually work with a quantum computer because you'll have an interface between your classical one and you'll be sending information to the quantum one so it'd be a really good way to start learning about all of this and hopefully you'll care more <laughs> yeah. hello thank you for the talk it was really interesting to listen i was wondering if you ever used a quantum computer yourself and if you did uh what was the your first computation that you've done I've never actually used one properly myself. I've, I've, well, kind of. I've, I've tested out the simulations, not the simulations, the things on um, the IBM um, one, and then there's also the Iron Trap Iron Q one on AWS. I've never actually tried. I know that's really bad. I've never actually tried one. I think working on them physically just put me off, to be honest. <laughs> Um, but I recommend you try it. Um, but I don't, okay, so I think what, yeah, so what, okay, let me rephrase it actually. If I were to use one, probably one of the things I'd be really, really interested in doing with it is probably health stuff, because, um, you know, with all our, like, all these, you've got loads and loads of medical devices now, and they bring loads and loads of information in. But the thing is, is 
you don't want to get overloaded by the information, but you do want to see what could be maybe exacerbating an illness with all of this information coming in. And that's going to be really hard to do with a classical computer because of all the different complexities. Like, for example, if you think about someone with diabetes, um, has their blood sugar gone low because they are ill, they forgot to eat, or they went running too long? And so I think that it's got really, really good applications in terms of that. But then you really want good encryption on that because it's people's medical data. Thank you. You've talked about how Grover and Shaw could be used to attack uh, asymmetric algorithms like RSA and elliptic curves. Only uh, Shaw. Okay. <laughs> um, what's the state of play with the symmetric algorithms? So is, is AES itself uh, safe or are there ways of attacking that with quantum computers? So that would be Grover's algorithm for attacking the symmetric keys. But again, with that one, it... it doesn't get, it's not gonna, you can do loads and loads of iterations, but it's not gonna give you a final answer, it's gonna give you a set of answers. And so that one is just, it's more or less a case of just increasing the key size in that situation, because the longer you have to search, the harder it's gonna be. But then you're also getting into the idea of bigger key sizes isn't great, because when you've got smaller devices, you're going to be using up more and more of the system, and that's, that's not a good thing. Like that one, I've seen people talk about um, having to possibly rethink threat modeling because that would add a new surface to it because if you've got larger key sizes, yeah, you can trigger a denial of service attack um, quite easily uh, by getting or basically trying to run the whole handshake over and over again, which is going to generate more and more keys, which is going to overload the system. But yeah, so at the moment, the bigger focus is on the asymmetric keys rather than the symmetric ones. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Sweet. Okay. Thank you for listening and putting up with all that math. Um, uh, that's my Twitter handle, uh, at Uzel, if you want to ask any other questions. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>